As we get to the close of our conversation, I want to switch gears to kind of just getting into the purely metaphysical with these things. Oh. Um, we've done a, yeah, you're happy about that. <laughs> we've done a few, you know, we, we've done a whole lot of good um, converse, conversing around relationship dynamics. So let's take it just to kind of the spiritual plane of, um, you know, like in spiritual practices, there's really just kind of these two categories where we can approach the divine, if we want to call it that, in a more feminine way or in a more masculine way. And, you know, in Hinduism, as I'm sure you know, the feminine path is called bhakti yoga, which is the path of devotion and surrender to the divine. And the masculine path is called jnana yoga, which means knowledge, the path of knowledge. And um, I think there's obvious necessity for any spiritual seeker to walk both of those paths rather than just one or the other. Uh, what I found for me personally, Teal, growing up in, uh, you grew up Mormon, correct? No, I grew up in a, in a Mormon society, but my parents were non-Mormon. Oh, that's right. Yeah, what an interesting situation to find oneself in. Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do another talk about that. Um, well, I grew up in an evangelical, as an evangelical pastor's son. Oh. Yeah, and uh, very much wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps. Went to Oral Roberts University to get my bachelor's degree in theology and music and started off as a full-time worship pastor at 23. <laughs> and I went through this huge awakening at 23 out of my religion and a lot of that was because I had a really good feminine relationship with the divine in that I was a worship leader. I would just sing songs to God all day and just poured my heart out in music to God and writing music. But um, as you know, Christianity doesn't have a lot of the masculine components of spirituality nailed down very well. They have very distorted ideas about who God is, what God yeah. is, how God operates. So I had this... Um, powerful feminine relationship with God, but like no real masculine relationship because I totally didn't understand who God really was. So that forced me to rupture my relationship with Christianity and become kind of a Eastern seeker for about seven or eight years, Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism and studying those traditions like crazy. And I really found what I was looking for in terms of the masculine knowledge of the divine. But then after those seven or eight years, I started to feel um, kind of like empty and cold on the inside. Like I had no life essence in me. I just had a bunch of knowledge, but no real um, experience of that knowledge. And that's when I kind of returned back to my Christian roots a bit and started listening to worship music again and, and worshiping through music again and entering more of that. Like I literally said, oh, I, I forgot I actually used to love God. You know, I, now I just want to know about God in Hinduism and Buddhism and get the non-duality concepts but I forgot that I used to just love God. And that's also a spiritual path. And so I really went hard back that direction and kind of ended up merging East with West, feminine, masculine. I'm curious, like how, how your path has unfolded in your own spiritual evolution. And like, how do you balance those two paths yourself? I have never looked at it in the way that you've just described. Oh. I, Yeah. I mean, I've very much more in terms of my own practice and what I'm teaching people is helping them to hold space for dichotomies. So if I was going to essentially listen to that interesting angle on the relationship to the spiritual, I would say my part in that is about and consciousness. It's about how important it is to, you know, let's say... It, to have these practices around things like surrender to what unfolds and also practices like conscious creation. Mm -hmm. um, things like, Oh, let's, let's practice disidentification. On the other hand, let's over here practice deliberate ownership of the ego. Right. Yeah. Which would be a very masculine kind of spiritual path, you know, mindfulness of the ego yeah. Versus um, some people's spiritual path is like service to others, doing good deeds, you know, feeding the poor. Um, that's also been a, a classic spiritual path, which I would say is more of a feminine approach. Yeah, I just um, don't think it's healthy to be in any one, any either, to be honest. Yeah, I've found that myself. It's like there is the only way really that you can avoid the pitfalls or the trappings of one is to be in the practice of some of the opposite, you know. Yeah. 
everybody who I have seen that has picked a, a decisive, almost polarized path for you know the spiritual awakening or whatever falls into all of the trappings of that particular path. Yeah, it's very true. Like you know, Christian powerlessness, for example, you know, mm -hmm. would be one example of that. Um, on the other hand, it's you know, almost like egoically believing that the entire universe organizes around you and you alone. So all mm -hmm. of a sudden, we're enhancing separation rather than interconnectedness by virtue of be like essentially creating a narcissistic bubble for ourselves of only that which we want to perceive. You know? Right, <laughs> which is what I feel like non-duality ends up being a lot of the time. Is a kind of almost like giving you a spiritual frontal lobotomy. Yep. You know, I, I just practice thinking that everything doesn't exist until I feel this detachment from reality. And now I'm free and enlightened. Oh my God. You are literally speaking straight to my heart. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you encounter some of the non dualists on that page in your community as well. Um, yeah. I find them to be the most disagreeable of commenters as well, like in terms of wanting to critique points made in a video. Um, most people that listen to spiritual teachings take them op more openly and loosely. We're using a lot of metaphors here, talking about esoteric things. Let's not take these words so literally. But then you get non-dualists on there that are like, you said this or that, that's dualistic. There is no this or that. There's just what is. And it's like, yes, yes, I know, but it's okay to be in the relative plane as well. And, you know, we need words to talk about things. And to me, the absolute <laughs> and the relative need to be seen yes. as the same. The yes, non-dual and the yes. dualistic are the same. That's and consciousness. Bingo. Now I get and consciousness. Yep. Is that how, how would you describe it? Like when you're teaching it to somebody who maybe has never heard it for the first time. What does and consciousness mean? And consciousness is the capacity to expand wide enough to hold dichotomies. So let's make this really practical. Mm. Um, and we really must in the spiritual field because this gets very complicated. I just did a are... lecture on this on Sunday in 40U. Oh. <laughs> holding dichotomies. Holding dichotomies is very difficult for humans because it throws people into cognitive dissonance. And so ultimately, right. the path of awakening is the path of being able to hold a state of cognitive dissonance without wanting to kill yourself. Okay. <laughs> Not <laughs> as right. easy as it sounds. Yeah, no. That, so that little joke aside, um, if we're walking down this, this awakening path, which anybody who's listening to this is, we have to start to take different dimensional realities into account. Obviously, things don't play out the same on, on different dimensions. For example, here in this time-space reality, we call this the temporal life experience. We experience death. We absolutely do. You know, if you no, get in a roadside deal. accident and you hold on to the body of somebody who is dying, you will watch, you know, you'll feel something, something leave that body uh -huh. and you will watch the body go into rigor mortis eventually when, you know, all the calcium is leaking out of the cells and that body will decompose and you will not perceive them to be there anymore. That's a reality in this temporal space. Let's go up to a higher dimensional level, one that's not temporal. That energy is literally just recycling. Right. The experience of life is like walking into and out of a movie theater. Both are true at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we have, so, and consciousness is to be able to hold both as true simultaneously. Yes, I love that. But this is not what we find people doing. And of course, most people use don't like cognitive dissonance. And so they use whatever belief to get them out of the cognitive dissonance. So you'll see people who will just say, no, there is no death. Death is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, actually, it's a reality in the temporal. Yes. Okay, so that's, that's how I would define and consciousness. Yeah, I, I love that so much. And when you brought up that example, it put a light bulb on uh, when I was watching a, a video from a couple of years ago, um, it, some non-duality teacher was doing a Q and a, and this woman was trying to formulate a question without tripping over all the non-duality wires, you know? <laughs> and so she's like spinning her head into a pretzel trying to phrase it. And it was so sad because she says, um, so uh, she, the mic is shaking. There is uh, a question. And the question is, um, 
my, my 12 year old son died in a car accident a few months ago, but it didn't really happen. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a, a feeling of sadness and, uh, it was heartbreaking to watch because you can see her gaslighting herself in real time. You didn't experience what you experienced, you know, and probably because she had some well-meaning spiritual friends who tried to tell her, no, 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 your son didn't die. He's not dead. Don't say that. Um, which there may be a time and place to say that if you're trying to bring in an absolute perspective, but uh, maybe you need to experience the humanness of the event yeah. first and the relative. And um, would you say, Teal, that maybe a, a healthy balance of those two planes, absolute and relative, in that balance would be like, no, I can experience death happening while, you know, in the external, while internally I'm not experiencing a loss happening. You know what no. I mean? Like the way that I see it is the way to do it is that these these non-physical aspects of self, the ones that are more in an objective reality, need to take powerful ownership of the temporal experience and stop negating it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you would say any way possible to escape the humanness of that experience, avoid it. Just go right into the humanness, the pain, yes. the feeling of death, the feeling yes. of loss. Yes. And feel that would you say feel it first and then bring in a higher perspective no i would say feel it first to the point where the only thing that makes sense is the higher perspective i mean what will happen if, I you're, love that. if you're really with an experience if you're like you know what i'm going I'm in it and i'm going through it and i'm not going to disown this aspect of myself is that you don't need to work hard at those perspectives that offer some benefit they occur i they love occur. that you're right, because that's that's what polarity is, is the presence of one is the ab uh, absence of the other. So if if you really get into the relative perspective of what's happening such that you, you know, the picture of Christ being crucified, just allow yourself to be crucified on that cross, then it can only, once you've gone as deep into that side of the spectrum as you can, the other can only come in at some point to balance it. It, it plateaus. Like that's what I wish people understood. It's very important that I'm saying this coming from a background of severe abuse. It's like when you dive into the hell of life, right? And you're like, no, I'm, I'm actually going to go through all of these experiences, you know, all the emotions that are part of this, wanting to kill this person, you know, not wanting to live anymore because what does life look like when I have to put myself back together again, when everybody else is able to build shit, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's this very human, it's like very raw sort of emotional space there's yeah. a point where it's like you hit it. It's like you will naturally hit it. It's hard for people to to know this because they never let themselves go there enough to hit it. They actually spend their whole time stuck because they're in resistance to it as much. They're like, mm -hmm. go in, nope, mm -hmm. go in, nope. You know. So like, if you let yourself go all the way through it, your own being is like, I'm not going to sit here doing this forever. All right, I've accepted acceptance. I've accepted the fact that that happened. Now what? And it's at that point when it's like, oh, that's an interesting idea. Oh, that's maybe an empowering step. Oh, like, and mm -hmm. then that is usually the point for these other types of perspectives to come in because they're no, they're in a space where it's like, oh, I'm adding to your experience now. I'm not negating your experience now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you just touched my passing subject here. <laughs> <Can you tell? laughs> did I touch I'm it? getting all riled up. I'm glad I did. Um, I'm going to even go further than that and say something that'll probably piss off some spiritual egos. But this is why I also, I agree with you that any, any teaching at all or practice at all that is inadvertently bypassing the human experience first is only doing a great disservice to the practitioner because, and this is the part that's going to piss off some non-duality people. When I look at somebody suffering, I see God suffering. Because I yes. can only see God in everyone. So yes, they would say, no, God doesn't suffer. That's so, not true. You are God. Right. Like, well, then who's suffering? Because I thought it was only God here. God has multiple perspectives. There is definitely to God. There's a, there is, we could say a temporal perspective that it's experiencing and also an objective perspective. I feel so validated. <laughs> I feel like I'm fighting that battle alone sometimes in this spirituality space. You are not fighting that space. battle alone. I am Good. fighting that battle with you. We're linking arms on that one then. Yes, we are. That's what makes suffering sacred to me. Why I can watch someone who's mourning the loss of their child or something and find a kind of aching beauty in it.
because the divine is experiencing itself in seemingly the most tormenting way possible, but yet that is giving it such powerful contrast to know its light. And it's the divine itself who's choosing to feel that. I mean, that's sacred and that's holy to me. And a lot of the spirituality, even ACIM world, which I'm a huge part of, will say that like God's not in that. There's no God there. And like, I understand what they're trying to say. They're looking at it from an absolute perspective. They're up in heaven looking down through the clouds. You know what I mean? But I'm down on earth looking up and saying, no, God is in there suffering in that body. And that's why I want to be present with that suffering. <laughs> Look, I'm not <laughs> added to that. It's just out of period. Okay. <laughs> I'll step off my soapbox now. <laughs> 